following interview was conducted with Professor Lawrence L. Ogborn, Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April the 1st, 2009 in Stewart 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Auburn, and good afternoon to you. Let's start in the where you were born and when and your early years and parents. I'm a native Hoosier. I was born in Richmond, Indiana, but I grew up around Terre Haute, North Terre Haute, as a matter of fact. And I like to your tell pa your pa parents relocate down there. Or? No, my parents uh, really were in Terre Haute for a long, long time. But uh, apparently, at about the time I was born, which is 1932, the economic situation was not too good. And the contractor my father worked for was able to get some construction work in Richmond, so that's where they went for okay, a short good. period of time. But uh, I can tell you later a story about Purdue related to some of these things. Please do. But uh, I was born in Richmond, but grew up in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, spent the first part of my life there. Then. Uh, when I graduated from high school in but 19... Tell us, can you tell us a little about your early years when you were in grade school and a little bit what you did in the high school? Well, I went to a little tiny rural grade school called okay. Otter Creek, which uh, typical of Indiana today has been swallowed up in consolidation, so it doesn't even exist anymore. There is a Vigo County uh, North High School now, and that takes in a much larger area than drew from, from my little town. The sign outside the town said population 800, it might have been a thousand while I was there, but it wasn't much more than that. So it was a very small town. Uh, nothing really outstanding to talk about during my grade school and high school years. Any student clubs at all? Or? Well, I was a basketball player in high school, and so that was all that was really important. Yeah, After really? all, I was a Hoosier. Right. So uh, there was only one thing important in life in that town, and that was basketball. <laughs> so, you and Larry Bird. <laughs> well, Larry was much better than I was. <laughs> but, uh, but I did enjoy playing basketball in high school and thought about college basketball playing a little bit, but decided I didn't have time for it, and I certainly didn't have the talent that you need to play for somebody like Purdue. Was the, your high school a large size when you were there? Or? Very small, uh, and we had the smallest graduating class that they'd had for years. It was under 30 people, so that was the total of my high school class. Okay. So we obviously knew each other, knew everybody and uh, couldn't get away with anything in that little town because everybody knew you. <laughs> they uh, saw I you. certainly tried. They saw you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it just wasn't worth even trying because you knew you'd get caught if you tried doing anything right, you shouldn't I be understand. doing. <laughs> right. So I enjoyed growing up in a little town. I had a lot of friends there. Uh, we scattered in all directions from that point. Do you have any brothers or sisters? No, I'm an only child. Okay. My father was one of 14. My mother was one of seven, and it always amused me how many of those, uh, my aunts and uncles, only had one or two children. It seems like they must have learned something from <laughs> being part of a large, large family. Perhaps. Yeah. No, I was an only child. Okay. And then now when you graduated from high school, what came next? Well, I immediately went into college, and I thought I wanted to be a chemical engineer because I enjoyed chemistry in high school. I went to Rose Holman. It was Rose Polytechnic Institute in the days when I was there. So I started there when, uh, right after graduating from high school in 1950 and graduated in 1954. Did you live on campus? No, I did not. I lived at home. In fact, it's one of the ways I could afford to go to college. Plus, I got scholarships. And, uh, needless to say, being a private school, it was considered an expensive place to go at that time and still. But even then and now, that school does give a lot of scholarships so uh, that was very helpful to me and living at home saved money so I missed the dorm life and not okay. had that experience. Any athletics or student activities that you I was involved in, involved in some, fraternity? some in student activities well I spent a lot of time at fraternities but I couldn't afford to join one but all my friends were in fraternities so uh, studied there and ran around with guys who hung out around the fraternity and at that point Rose Holman was an all-male school they had no women. They do now. Uh, but there was an all-girls school not far away, uh, St. Mary's, a Catholic school in Terre Haute. Mm -hmm. And Indiana State was close by, so there were lots of contacts with college kids. Right, a lot of activities. But I, I was active in the Purdue, or the Purdue, the Rose Holman Radio Club. I got interested in amateur radio, and that caused me to switch disciplines in my 
middle of my sophomore year, I became an electrical engineer rather than a chemical engineer. And I've enjoyed being in that profession very much ever since that time. Then I graduated in 54, mm-hmm. told all my friends, you'll never see me in a classroom again as long as I live. And I was did sick they, of school. Did they, did they also did they learn from you that what was your next move or did no one ask you that? <laughs> Well, they liked to tease me when I came back for a class reunion, so are you still in school? You know, they remembered what I said. <laughs> but I, I left, and of course I got married right out of uh, school. Oh, where did you meet your wife in school? In high school, my okay. senior year. She moved into that little town, and I saw a good thing <laughs> and recognized it, and uh, we got married uh, immediately after I graduated from college. Okay, good. And her father was a professor at... Uh, at uh, Indiana State, as a matter of fact, in, in the music area. But uh, just a word about my two parents. I like to tell everybody my two parents were not born in the United States. My mother was born in Wales. She came to this country as an infant, so she never knew anything but the U.S. And my father was born in Flagstaff, Arizona, which was not the United States because it was 1896, and it wasn't a state yet. So he was born in, in one of the Western territories. But I grew up in Terre Haute. That's, that's where I spent. Where did they meet then? Well, I think my father had some construction work in the area, and some of the rumors that I picked up that they, uh, they would occasionally joke about, I think my mom was working as a waitress in a little restaurant in Sullivan, Indiana. Uh, my grandparents, uh, maternal grandparents, were in Shelburne, Indiana, just south of Terre Haute. Next town south of that was Sullivan. And I think my dad came in for uh, dinner one evening, the service there was, was great. Huh? The service was great, and uh, <laughs> the waitress was very attractive, and so he was hooked right there. And that's the way they. We were. can help me out at home. Right. right. <laughs> gotcha. Well, that's the background when they're very, very early days. That's good. Now, as soon as I graduated from college, as I said, I didn't want to go to school anymore. I was sick of school, so I went to work in industry, and I feel extremely fortunate. To, uh, was there no military service? You did not have to. This was during the oh. Korean War. I assumed I would be drafted pretty quickly. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do in the military. They had ROTC at Rose Holman, and I was originally signed up to go into officer's training to take the advance for the last two years. Everybody did the first two at uh, Rose in those days. But uh, they changed some of the requirements and so forth, and I decided that they changed the game in midstream for me. I didn't think that was fair, and so I walked away from it. I don't think I was uh, real popular with the folks there in the, in the military. That didn't mean I wasn't interested. I just wasn't happy with that particular situation. So I decided, well, I'll get a job in industry, and when I get called up, I get called up. Meanwhile, I'll snoop around. Maybe there's a place in the military that I would find most interesting. Well, I was hired by Bell Telephone Laboratories, and that's a legendary place in the history of uh, electrical engineering, particularly the electronics area, whole communications business, not just telephone. That was it. They were Mr. They were it. And there are many names that you can mention in the history of electrical engineering. The whole area of feedback theory, um, it was invented by a Bell Labs engineer by the name of Harold Black. He thought it up one day on a ferry boat crossing the Hudson River from New Jersey into uh, Manhattan, where the offices were at that time. They actually got a patent on that. I wish I'd had a patent on negative feedback. That uh, that would have been a very, very worthwhile patent to own. Also, a transistor was invented there, although I like to tell people now that the primary work that led to it was done at Purdue prior to the time that uh, Bell Labs invented the transistor. But those people who were involved with this, they were down the hall from me. Heinrich Bode, a mathematician in in that area, Harold Black, many other people like that were close by and around me. And I I was hired in at Whippany, New Jersey, that facility. The home office then was in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And I spent almost a year out of my two years there at Murray Hill. But my home base was in Whippany, and that was military work. And so I told my boss I'm probably going to be drafted. And he said, oh, no, you're not. We need you here. And so they were able to get a deferment for me, and we did work for the Navy. And what wonderful people to be around early in your career. I got stuck between two engineers. One was a Ph.D. from Caltech. One was a Ph.D. from MIT. 
as you can imagine, they had a heart attack when they heard I decided to go to Purdue for graduate work. They said everybody ought to go to either MIT or Caltech. East and or of West. course, East one, each one of them had their own opinion as to which was best. But in, in the very first job that I had, my mentor in electrical engineering was an intelligence officer on MacArthur's staff in World War II in the South Pacific. And the other guy, who was the best engineer I have ever known in my life, and did a lot of foundation work in what is called now human engineering. And if you're interested in a funny story, I'll tell you one about that. We were going on radar systems for a missile. It was the, the missile name was the Terrier system. It was after the Nike system, which was more of a land-based system. And this was to protect the Navy from enemy aircraft. Well, one of the gentlemen, this one I work with, he had been on a small carrier in World War II, sunk well, you know, he was on duty there in the Battle of the Coral Sea. They lost track of the Japanese Navy, blundered north, ran right into the, so they found him. And it was one of the last major naval engagements because they did win that battle. In 40, but it was, 1942. It was, was that the date? It yeah. was right in that time frame, I knew that. And he was, those guys pressed me because they knew the men who would be using the equipment. They were concerned about them being in harm's way, and they wanted only the best for them. And us whippersnappers coming along, they rode us pretty hard. And I remember the first little thing I did was for a little radar console, and I went down below on the right-hand side, and I was very proud of myself because I tried it out, and it worked fine. And I took it in, and I showed him, and I was shaking because he had a reputation of being pretty hard on the young guys. And he said, Larry, your design looks fine except for one thing. As an engineer, your arms are too long. I had no idea what he was talking about. I'm tall. He said, why don't you go down and get one of the secretaries and bring her up here and see if she can use your equipment? Well, my adjustments were down here, and I had to look at a radar screen up above me. And since this knob was down so low, a person with shorter arms couldn't do it. So my electronics was fine, but my engineering was not very good. So good I learned story. a good lesson. So I loved, I loved the work that I had there. And I finally decided I needed more education. And because of my work at Bell Labs, I decided I would take a year off, go get a master's degree somewhere, and then I would go back to Bell Labs because I was very happy there. Well, I looked around, wrote different places, including Caltech and MIT, but I was most impressed with the response that I got from Purdue at that time. Furthermore, home was only 90 miles south of here, so that was another added benefit, so I decided to come to Purdue. So I told everybody I was a very slow student. It took me over 40 years to graduate from this place. <laughs> That's nice. Very nice. Yeah, and were your, were, did you have any children by that time? or We had one daughter. Mm -hmm. um, when you were living in New Jersey? No, no, oh, no. When, this when was after we came to Purdue. Okay. Uh, she was adopted. She's a little older when we adopted her. She's no longer living. But uh, I have two granddaughters, and I uh, do get to see them pretty regularly. That's good. And enjoy family yeah. life that way right. very much. And, of course, I never lacked for, talking about a large family, I never lacked for cousins. I wouldn't think so. No. <laughs> well, tell us a little about when you came then. And uh, was this an NC ECE or electric or computer? It was electrical, electrical engineering, engineering at that, that time. Right. There was no computer engineering associated with the department at that time. It was, I think now looking back, a rather small department. Purdue was rather small. I don't think there were more than 12,000, 13,000 students on this the campus. This was in the 50s. Yeah, this right. was 1954 when I came here. Mm -hmm. No, excuse me, 1956 when I came here. I left undergraduate school in 54, East Coast two years, came here, here in the fall of 1956. All right. So I got my master's degree in, in 57. I really got hooked on teaching. I was a graduate teaching assistant the uh, year, first year I was here. I really enjoyed it. And then became a, an instructor while I worked on my PhD. And when I finished my doctoral program, I decided I would stay in teaching somewhere, looked around a few places. Purdue offered me a job. Why not stay here? So I did. 
Sometimes people have said that they oftentimes encourage people maybe to go elsewhere and then come back. Um, that, that may vary, you know, probably. Well, it's the old thing, maybe a prophet is without honor in his own country or whatever the little statement says. I think that it is probably good for people to go. It might have been better for me to have done that. It's hard to tell. I may never have come back if I'd gone somewhere else because I enjoy the profession. I don't know that it made that much difference where I was. I think I would have probably found something fun and interesting to do. Because you enjoyed your field. Because I enjoyed my field. It was changing so dramatically at the time I finished. Uh, You know, I still worked on vacuum tubes in my first job at Bell Labs. And I'm one of the few people around who still (laughs) remembers what they were about, how one could use one. (laughs) What they are, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I'm I'm glad I stayed here. I enjoyed my stay here in a large uh, research-type university. The department grew enormously. We changed the name. Heavily involved in computer work now. Uh, Who Who was the head when you came? Oh my goodness! Would that have been? This was—you'd uh, have to look back. I'm—I'm I'm, I'm terrible at names in my old age here. Uh, I can't remember. John Hancock. Well, no, it was before John Han- Hancock. Hancock. Before Way before that. Somebody before that. There were okay. two or three heads before that, sure. as a matter of fact, right. uh, that we had. Dean po- the Potter was the dean. Dean Potter was dean. Yes, uh, he was He's here the forever. the longest. You're safe in that. <laughs> you got the whole range. He was there when I arrived, and. Uh, I got to know him a little bit. He was uh, maybe what they would call in management today a walk-around manager. He did not sit in his office all the time. And he would wander in the building, and if the door was open, he'd wander in. What are you up to? What is this good for? Why are you doing this? Is that right? Oh, yeah. I, and, and it was a fun experience because he'd sit and think about it a little bit, and he'd come up with suggestions. So, Maybe you ought to look at this. And, oh, I hadn't thought of that. You know. Super. Oh, yeah. that's great. He was, he was a marvelous guy. I've heard stories, and I remember seeing when they were building the Potter Center, he was out there almost every day, you know, looking at it and then observing what was going on. Right. You know, so he really was really involved. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Well, I've enjoyed watching construction work on campus. There's been a great deal because I grew up with that and worked right, in right. summers as an apprentice carpenter when I was young. Sure, so. right. Okay. Talk a little bit about your teaching and then we'll go into research. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Uh, I became an uh, assistant professor here and I think it was about 1961. I uh, was assistant professor about three years, became an associate professor, which was a terminal rank that I attained here at Purdue. I was heavily involved in the teaching programs and liked the teaching part very much. Particularly later in my career, I got more involved with laboratory programs than I ever had intended to, sort of got pushed on me, but I did enjoy that, it turned out, because I enjoy experimental research, uh, as opposed to just sitting, reading a book, or scratching out mathematics all the time. I enjoy being in a laboratory. But I taught almost all of the undergraduate courses. You mentioned John Hancock, who was head, he's well known in the communications area. I even assisted him early in my career in teaching a communications course, enjoyed that relationship. Oh, I very so, much. Yeah. So I taught beginning circuits classes. Uh, my field is electronics, and interestingly enough, I did not teach the first course in electronics any time during the early part of my career. Only late in my career did I, for three or four semesters, get to go back and teach that very first course, which was fun. It was something different. Sure. But mostly I taught uh, courses in that area at the graduate level. Right. Well, what was the... Uh the site, the enrollment increased, and why did they decide to change the name on that? I'm thinking of something researchers might ask. The history of that at Purdue is interesting, and I'm sure there are other people who could tell you more about that than I can. But it goes something like this. Around the country, there was a movement to include computer engineering, computer science, actually, in the electrical engineering program. And the reason was that electronics was driving the development of computers. Space program had an enormous impact. You had to have computational capability to do the things that they were trying to do early in the space program. There's just no other way around it. World War II started this with radar and uh, drift into areas like we now call automatic control or control theory. Very mathematical from a theoretical point of view, but To do these things, you needed the electronics, small size, 
The ideal electronic gadget occupies no space, weighs nothing, costs nothing, and will last forever. That's what you shoot for. So that's what you needed in space vehicles. So electrical engineering in some ways, I think, drove the computer science part of this because you could not have computer science without a computer, and you could not have a computer without modern electronics. So most schools, the computer science aspect of this was integrated in to the electrical engineering curriculum. Here at Purdue, it was done differently. It became a part of the math department. And I think with some of my colleagues in math, they looked at it as a bit of an orphan. They didn't know what to do with it exactly because it was growing and changing so rapidly compared to the classical mathematics fields. And eventually, because of the hardware side of it, we brought the hardware part of it into electrical engineering at Purdue, but left the computer science side of it, more the software side of it, with the computer science. But there's a great deal of software taught in the program in electrical and computer engineering. Were you involved in any, were there any curriculum changes? I imagine curriculum changes occurred. Enormous number of curriculum co changes. I was heavily involved in that. I was chairman of our curriculum committee for quite a long time and enjoyed working on those kinds of changes. And I used to tease my younger colleagues in the computer engineering area because they were constantly changing their classes. And they had too many classes. And I remember running into three or four of the really young ones, the hot shots in the field, over the union building for lunch one day in the basement over there. And we had a good time talking, and I really tore into them and gave them a hard time, explained to them facts of life, that you couldn't keep changing classes, and you had to have a certain number of classes. And would you believe they caved in and they agreed to me? And then I turned around and I said, no, you shouldn't agree with me because the problem is we don't even know what's basic yet in that field. So you have to change almost every other year what you were teaching. It's and it was important to do that, and they were doing the right thing. But it bothered some of the older faculty <laughs> that they had to do this. And I, I was in the middle, and I enjoyed <laughs> arguing with both sides. On both sides, right. There you go. <laughs> uh, the school is really, the school has changed a lot, you know. Uh, enrollment has increased, the, the, the research has increased a lot too. The research has grown, I think, even more than the undergraduate program has grown. I was looking for some dates when you asked to talk to me, and one of the things late in my career I was asked to do, and I said, I absolutely will not do this more than three years, tops. Well, I ended up doing it 10 years, and that was running our undergraduate office. And it was done at the same time one of my close colleagues was running the graduate office, and they were right next to each other, and and we were able to work together on quite a few things. And I ended up enjoying that. And I also ran our cooperative engineering program. Tell us about that. And during that time. Well, the co-op program is a long-established program at Purdue. Uh, I'm sure it exists in schools outside of engineering. But it's very strong within engineering. Each of the disciplines, whether it be chemical or mechanical or whatever, have their own co-op programs. And we have uh, rules and regulations. Our co-op program really only makes it open to the better students. And since it's really only open to the better students, I'm not sure that's really fair, but it turns out it makes it very easy to place them because that's who industry wants. So the, the number of companies that hired electrical engineering students before I was there, during the time I was there, and I'm sure still, it's just huge. I couldn't begin to tell you all of them, but uh, you know, we were talking about computers. Hewlett Packard's in the computer business as well as instrumentation. Instrumentation was one of my major fields. Uh, they hired large numbers of our uh, co-op students. Uh, chemical engineering companies hired DuPont, Dow, wanted electrical engineering students, which always amazed me that they, they needed people. I uh, went up to uh, visit uh, Dow in Michigan one time. They invited me up there, and the corresponding professor in chemical engineering was a pilot, and they had a Purdue Pilots Club here, so it was easier to fly a light plane up to Midland than take commercial flights because it would have taken a day to get there and a day to get home. And they met us at the little airport, picked us up, and took us there. And after that day was over, he uh, was a good friend and gave me a hard time. He says, well, I'm not taking you 
on a trip like this again because they ignored him and talked to me. It was easy for them to recruit chemical engineering students, but for a chemistry company, DuPont, uh, Dow, people like that, electrical engineers said, well, why would I work for a company like that? Well, there were enormous opportunities. The defense companies, TRW was one I was close ties with. They were in the space program, they were in the defense program. So uh, it was a very large program. The students alternated semester here, semester out, summer here, semester out, and so on. It just those three academic programs, every other unit, they would be gone from campus and, and working away. And I really enjoyed that. How did the, were there some times during that period when the economy would have been impact on the co-op as far as that or not? During that 10 year period, it wasn't too bad for me to uh, try to place people. I've seen this over the years, and of course we're seeing it right now. And it always amuses me to watch the engineering companies come in and they'll talk to the professors. And one of the things they expect us to do is to give them a little uh, insight into what their competitors are doing. Well, is, uh, is uh, you know, Motorola hiring yet? You know? So why don't you ask them is what I typically tell them. But they would all be overloaded with work, screaming at management to hire more engineers, but management would be afraid, many times rightly so. Right. And then finally, somebody would break the barrier and start to hire. And as soon as that happened, it was overnight. Oh, well, they're doing it. We've got to keep up. They're going to get all the good people. Very competitive. Very competitive <laughs> type of thing. And they were immediately on campus hiring people. So that's, that's kind of the way it went. Right. What about internships? Were, we, were you involved at all? With the well, only internships? indirectly. We had a formal co-op program. We tried to help companies as we could through the undergraduate office and through individual professors find people to, uh, to work for companies in the summer times as interns. Sure. So the co-op program was a very special type right. of intern program. Right. Exactly. And then of course TAP came along during the period of time that you were here and that, that was probably when you first year TAP probably didn't exist. TAP right? did not exist. Technical assistance program right. I assume is what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. It did not exist at that time. It came into being while I was here. Uh, that you want to talk about research. We were yeah. involved in research, would you believe, on electric and hybrid vehicles at Purdue very, very heavily for a period of time during the last great gas shortage. And I was trying to remember really late 70s to mid 80s right. was that period of... And the around the end of the Carter and the beginning of Reagan around that Right, time, in sure. that general time frame. So uh, we, we were involved with that and we had uh, students in those programs, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students. And I guess I lost track of the question you really no, asked. that's okay. Yeah, you know, you're fine. Uh, but that program then led, I think, to the TAP program, which you would ask about. And I was involved with that. I was the electrical engineering representative for a short period of time, two or three years, I was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about, if you want to make other comments on your research, particularly that one on the, the Westinghouse thing that you do with Dr. Linden. Okay, well, let's back up earlier than Good. that. Uh, okay. I uh, get kidded sometimes I was ahead of my time. For some reason, I got interested in medical electronics very, very early in my career. One of the reasons maybe is that Bell Labs had some activities in that. When I wasn't working on military systems, I thought, gee, it would be fun to, to work on something more civilian-oriented rather than the military-type activities. So I tried to get involved with that, and Purdue had a small contingent of professors interested in that very early on. Uh, there was a professor in veterinary medicine that he and I worked together, and I'm trying to think of his name. It may come to me in a minute. But I think about the first three PhD students I had were kind of in that area and did some work on um, really measurement related things that turned out to be related to a problem that my mother had in her terminal illness, would you believe? And that is that uh, it's called encephalitis and fluid tends to collect and you need to be able to drain that from the head. Well, how do you do this and how do you measure the pressure up in there? 
And so we played around with some early fiber optics type measurement ideas way, way before anybody was doing this to transmit telephone messages and things of that sort over fiber optics. And that was done, first of all, in cooperation with uh, the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine. But it became more formalized later on after I got out of that area, pretty much. But early on also, uh, through a unique experience I had, my wife was Helen Schliemann, the Dean of Students, office manager, during the time I was a graduate student and then an early part of my career. So I got to know Helen Schliemann, Barb Cook, Bev Stone, all these wonderful people who were, were in that, that office. And one of the ladies who worked in the office with my wife, husband, was a professor in, of all places, entomology. So what do bugs have to do with electrical engineering? Well, I got involved with a cockroach problem. And many people have asked me about that over the years. How in the world did you ever get involved working with cockroaches? Well, Dan Shanklin, who was the professor in, in uh, entomology, and I used to laugh and say, well, they're a readily available subject for research. I was going to say that, <laughs> yes. You don't have to ask permission from the government like you do with people. <laughs> you just pick yeah. them up and go to work on them, you know, <laughs> and nobody objects Check to your, them. Uh, uh, your front door before right. you leave. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting what happened there. I was in instrumentation work, and I was interested particularly in sensors. How do you measure motion? This fits in with control applications. You make a robot. It has to be able to see. It has to be able to feel. Uh, well, it has to have sensory systems of sort, some sort. So very fundamental level, how do you do those things? How do you, how do you measure temperature? How do you measure pressure? I mentioned the fiber optics part. How do you do that? Well, Dan Shanklin, we were having lunch one day together with our wives. They were talking about something, and Dan said, you know, I got an interesting problem you ought to be able to help me with. One of my graduate students has located two sensors in the abdomen of the cockroach. And we're trying to characterize them, that is, describe them, figure out what they're doing, how they work. I said, well, what do they do? If you put electrodes on the nerve that's associated with this, you see electrical signals coming in, and they're like little pulses. Well, my next question as an engineer is, how is the information encoded? So he tried to explain that to me, but I said, finally I threw up my hands and I said, let me see it. Let me come look at it. So I went over to his lab within, I think, a day or two, and we sat down with a grad student, and they hooked up this very sensitive electrical connection, two little wires down into the abdomen of the roach. The student was very good at microsurgery. He uh, was able to open this up, get into the spot, and so as he would pull on the abdomen and stretch it, the frequency of the pulses would increase. So obviously this was a digital-like sensor, and this was way before people talking about things like that much. But these were the kinds of things that interested me. Well, there were two of these. And both of them seemed to be when you pull on something, they both started, as they said, firing, putting out little pulses. And so I learned a lot about biology during this period of time and enjoyed it very much. And we found out, for instance, by looking at this, that the frequency of the pulses coming out of the roach's belly was proportional to stretch. So it was a stretch receptor. It was measuring position, if you wish, how, how far the abdomen moved in a particular direction. But there was another one that measured in another direction, but it had another part of information associated with it. We were pretty sure it was measuring velocity. Now that made sense to me. If I was building a rocket to go up, or a robot to move around, I'd want to know how fast something was moving as well as where it was. So that's how I got started in some of these kinds of things. Unfortunately, Dan left the university and became department head at a School of Entomology in another location, and that activity just quit we, overnight. But, but you got some publications out of it. We, we got some attention out of it. We okay. never did get a lot of publication out of it. It was kind of a pioneering work early on. And if he'd stayed around, I'm sure we'd have gotten yeah, right, a good many exactly. publications out of it. <laughs> oh. But that got me started in that area. So. Right. And the other one I was going to, you were going to just make a comment was that one, you and Professor Lindenmott at Westinghouse 
Well, there were several grants that we were, John and I, John Lindelob and I were involved with. Uh, it involved teaching techniques of various kinds. John really got into that, particularly in the laboratory area in which I was also involved, but how to make sort of self-paced, self-learning uh, bits and pieces of courses where a student would not even need to go to a lecture. A student could come in, could sit down, maybe the television was there, maybe a tape recorder was there, maybe there was a laboratory set up there, but that they could do some things on their own, hands-on type of activities. But one of the activities that John and I got involved in was teaching using television. And so some of these grants tied into some of those activities. And John and I, I think, were among the first set of professors who ever taught graduate level courses to the outside world from Purdue using our television set. And this on a local program as much or in house? This, this was a program that originally started, it's kind of related to the technical assistance program, but preceded it by a long time frame. That uh, you look at uh, Duck Remy, uh, the Division of General Motors over in the Kokomo area, um, the uh, solid state activities that they had going on to transistorize, computerize automobiles, uh, the research laboratory for General Motors, research laboratory for Ford, uh, Eli Lilly. A lot of companies, particularly in Indiana, wanted their engineers to get more education. But they didn't want them to leave like I did and disappear for a year and then maybe not come back, I think. So what they wanted, wanted was an in-house training program. So early on, I made trips to Indianapolis, taught the Naval Avionics Facility, uh, special courses over to uh, Duco Remy, uh, Duco Electronics, uh, various locations such as that. One-on-one one in the class? No, it was, it was just like Purdue. I went there, in fact, sometimes even got uh, graduate credit for the class. I might teach a class like I taught at Purdue, but I'd have a division of it going there. I'd meet them one evening a week, and we'd work at it for three hours. Uh, <laughs> poor guys would really be beaten down, but it did work, and they could get credit for classes that way. But they decided it would be better if you could deliver it remotely. It was questioned whether those classes were really the same level as what was being taught here. But if it was taught over a television link, they could have a classroom in the engineering facilities at these various companies, and I could stand in a classroom here at Purdue, and while I'm teaching the Purdue class, I'm teaching that class. And that really worked very well, and John and I helped pioneer that kind of teaching. We were among, we were really the first two in electrical engineering that did that. And the first time it was done, was done in a little old temporary concert hut over between, uh, well, it's kind of where the uh, engineering technology building now sits that was done in that area. Moved into the Potter building eventually. And in the latter part of my career, I taught classes out of there in a very fine TV studio. And it went further than just Indiana you went to companies outside of Indiana, were based in Indiana, and then eventually we hooked up with the National Technological University, NTU, and these courses, at least my course, was taught all over the country. And it was a unique teaching experience. I would say so. And uh, John and I did publish a little on this and, and the techniques that we used, the gimmicks that we used to get this going. I think I taught almost every third semester for many, many years, one specific graduate course, and when it was taught, I might have 20, 25 students here at Purdue, and then four here, one there, three here, you know, they were from California to New England. To so while you were teaching it here at the same time, they'd be tuning, they were, in, tuning in on the TV. They could watch it live. And they also then started taping these courses because some people couldn't arrange to have it done live and they would ship the tapes. And I had an interesting experience. Uh, some years after I had been doing this, a new graduate student came to me, turned to be one of the best I'd ever had. 
and I needed a graduate teaching assistant to help me with the television class. And I said, I sure wish you'd been here at Purdue and taken my class. I said, I'd make you a teaching assistant for my class. And he smiled and he said, I took your class. And I said, no, you weren't in my class. I would have remembered you. I was in your class. And then he smiled and I thought he was off campus. And he was working at Texas Instruments in Texas. He took the class. And I was so embarrassed because I got my old class notes. It was four or five or years earlier. I got my class notes in my grade book. And I looked back. And that one student at Texas Instrument, he never called me. He never asked any questions. He was the top student in the class. I'm not talking about the Purdue local class, but Purdue local plus all, he was the number one student. And then he came to be a PhD student under me a few years later, and he thought that was very funny. Well, I was very embarrassed when he told that on me. One question about the co-op program. Uh, how did you, were you able to get the employers? Did you work pretty closely with them, or how did that, I'm thinking of researchers saying, how, how did they just drop in? That I, I don't know. Well, they would always drop in when they were here recruiting. Sure. They would always come by, stop in. But you'd, you'd have to have some contacts so you know we, you may have some openings and... There was some counterpart to me in each of these companies. In other words, somebody that I had a one-to-one -one relationship with. Somebody the company has desi had designated as their co-op representative to Purdue. Okay. And that's the way the arrangement worked, worked out. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. And it worked very well. Right, yeah. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, how about um, diversity? Uh, that's changed over time. Well, you surprised me by asking about that. I hadn't thought about that much. But I like to tell people I think I was very active in helping get more women into engineering at Purdue. And it was a very selfish motivation on my part because the very rare woman that was in an engineering class when I was a young professor, they were always one of the best students in the class. So why not get more? You know? So uh, I, I did uh, work with freshman engineering and tried to help where I could. Went out on some of the recruiting trips with some of their folks and tried to make a special point of helping encourage uh, women as one of the groups. Uh, it's a strange group when you start talking about diversity because it's the largest single group in the, in the pool of humans, there are more women than men. But in engineering, they definitely were a minority group. Uh, the other place where we worked very hard trying to uh, recruit students are black students, particularly from Indianapolis type schools, in inner city areas, and that's been a, a hard road. It's been very difficult to, uh, to make that work. Um, so I did help with that, but the greatest activities there were through freshman engineering program. Because of the first year thing. Because it's a first year thing. Right. Once you got them there, you know, then we grab them. You know, right. We try, exactly. try very hard to, to hold on to that's it. That's right, yeah. And then, of course, the um, strategic plan as well. They had, it was the mission more for Barry and then Jess Gamble, a strategic plan. And, uh, well, with our current president, I'm sure it's a... Oh, yeah, but they, t they, they're similar, but the, the, the terminology is, is uh, and the focus is, uh, is different. They, they have changed the focus somewhat. But I think, I really think, from about the time I started in the early 60s as a professor... Dr. Covdy was the president when you came, right? Yes, he was president when I came here, and I really think... There was a conscious effort on some people's part to try to do more, but it was difficult to get anything to happen at that particular time. I first saw discrimination, sexual discrimination of a sort, in Bell Telephone Laboratories of all places. We had uh, a group of very high quality engineers, I thought. Everybody who was an engineer, the person who was at the top, person in Bell Telephone Laboratories or a green kid like me right out of undergraduate school, our title was member of technical staff. And that was the title for an engineer, member of the technical staff. In the group I worked with, a lot of old military guys in this group in very responsible positions in World War II. There were engineers in the middle years and there were quite a group of young whippersnappers like me who were just getting started. There was one technical woman in our group, 
and she had degrees in mathematics and physics. Well, because what we did was very mathematical, much of the work, she was our systems person, we called her. And she was extremely bright, and as far as our group was concerned, she was equal to any of us. And we treated, everybody treated her that way. And finally, one day, I got up enough courage to ask her a question. She did not have the, mem the rank of member of technical staff. She was considered a technician, which primarily in our group was made up of former World War II electronics technicians who had been in the service, military type people. They built the equipment, did a lot of the testing and so forth. She had that rank, but she did work certainly as technical or more so than any of us as engineers. Mm -hmm. And I had a real nice chat with her about that one day, and I think she had some influence on me. That she said, well, you have to realize the times we're in. I put up with it, but wherever I can, I jab a little prod in and make my points, and I'm making progress, and don't you forget this. And I did. So I appreciate what she yeah, did for me. It was me. a good conversation, I'd say. That's right. Um, and the school celebrated its 100th anniversary, didn't it, in 1988? Yes, it activities. did. Right. Seems, it's sort of nice to be around for something like that, I think. I enjoyed that time. Uh, they were putting together exhibits. And I... People come back. That it people came back. Haven't been here for a long time. Uh, Bill Haight, who was a renowned professor in our department, department had for many years, but he was one of the world's greatest classroom teachers. And he conducted a class for anybody who wanted to come back and sit through double E 201, the very first class in electrical engineering, and he taught it just the way, taught it, and they all loved it, you know, when they came back. And, and so we had a good time during the time. I found an old ancient oscilloscope that I bought at a ham radio auction somewhere. It was the first oscilloscope I ever owned that was my own. It was made by RCA, and I hadn't used it in years, but it was in the junk. So I donated it to Purdue, and it's still in the basement somewhere over there. But you can pull it apart, and you can really see how the old-time equipment worked. And they had that out as one of their displays. That's, That's good. Right. That's very nice. So we, we enjoyed that milestone. Yeah, I would think so. All right, yeah. <clears throat> then there, one thing that sort of caught my eye, you used to have a distinguished lecture series uh, that started in 84. And one of the speakers in 86 was Robert Jarvie, the one that did the artificial, you know, the artificial. Right. And, uh, you remember he had that ad on TV for some period of time and for Lepitor, Le Lepitor or something like mm -hmm. that. But yeah, there quite a few people, and I just happened to, there were too many news things on that particular news release. He was the speaker. I don't know why there wasn't more news on that. It's kind of a shame. Uh, I remember one of the speakers. You remember when Jar the Jarvik did? I remember that, that, and I remember uh, particularly uh, somebody who was uh, a classmate of mine in graduate school, Bob Lucky. Was, Every name rings a bell. Yeah, he's a, been an internationally renowned engineer and went to work for Bell Labs, it turned out. Stayed there. He didn't come back to a university like, like I did. He uh, gave an outstanding presentation. They had some really great people right. do that. And back to Bell Labs, in the days when you were, was that really the electronics and communication? I mean, that was it, AT&T and Bell Labs, pretty much? Well, with the old Bell system, which it's for old timers like me, it seems like a shame they broke it up. But there were the operating companies who sold you telephones, Indiana Bell. There was the research facility, which was Bell Laboratories. They had a manufacturing unit which built all the equipment, which was Western Electric. And then they had what they referred to as the Long Lines Division, which is a funny name, but it was the Long Distance Telephone service I, I in the old age. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was there when they were switching to modern electronic telephone Swiss systems. The first electronic telephone switching system was put in Morris, Illinois. Uh, there's a Western Electric facility in the Chicago area. There's, there's some in the south, or were, all over the place. Large ones in Indianapolis at the time that this was happening. And the first electronic switching system was referred to as the Morris Electronic Switching System, and the acronym was MESS, M-E-S-S. -S. 
So those engineers had senses of humor, too. <laughs> you needed that to kind of, you know, make it work. Right. <laughs> Terry, you just your brief contact as a, uh, a FAC fellow? Tell Briefly, I was a FAC fellow in, in Cary Quad. My, my schedule was such that I really couldn't get over there as much as I should, and we had kind of a mutual parting of the ways. But I did enjoy my time there. Uh, when I first started, there were, was a particularly good student leadership group over there at Cary Hall, and they seemed to get interested in some things I was doing, and we had a good time together for a while, but I got particularly involved in running our undergraduate office, which was a full-time, almost right. round-the-clock job sometimes, right. and was unable to get out of it for several years <laughs> once I got into it. <laughs> so you want to be careful what you volunteer to do. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. And then you served under Hofde and Hansen and Dr. Baring and Dr. Teske. Right. And, um, <clears throat> and the new president then. How about uh, any awards or honors that you'd like to share with us and your professional associations? Oh, I don't have major awards. I got some teaching awards in Good. my department. That's very key. And uh, I, I'm proud of those because I really enjoyed teaching and enjoyed uh, working with my students. Uh, my favorite question for students I had trouble with is, why are you here? And boy, was that a wonderful question to ask students. You'd be amazed at the answers you got. They were never what I expected. You remember <laughs> so any examples? So it was an education for me. Well, one of the standard ones was, particularly with the student having some problems, was, well, Aunt Millie or Uncle Joe was an engineer, and they thought that's what I ought to do. And my next comment was, well, I think electrical engineering is the best place in the world for anybody to be, but if you don't think so, you don't belong here. And I remember uh, asking one kid this, and I said, I don't want you to even stop and think for any period of time. If you could do anything you wanted to do, tell me right now, what would you really like to do? And he said, study history. Well, why don't you study history? Well, I don't think I could get a job if I had a history background. And I like computers. I said, history profs are very interested in computers. Archiving trying to keep track of things. You need a computer. They need people with interested in computers to help them. Why don't you go talk to them? He did that, and I saw him briefly once after that, and he was gone. <laughs> and he I'm, sure, I'm right. sure he did the right thing. In other words, I think a lot of people enter a discipline for the wrong reasons. And part of what is a wonderful experience for college students is if they really snoop around and find out what's out there, they'll find the right niche for them. I, I did. I didn't stay in chemical engineering. Right. I like chemistry, but I ended up doing something entirely different. Yeah, right. Um, now that we talk about uh, your retirement activities, what are you involved in? I'm still involved in things at Purdue. Okay. Uh, I helped start a senior design class that's required for graduation here. And I still come back and help with that. In fact, I was volunteering over at the library, selling books at the book sale. And in walks uh, a lady who I work with in electrical engineering quite a bit. And she said, oh, we're having our preliminary design reviews tomorrow, Friday. Why don't you come and join us? And I looked at my schedule and said, maybe I can make that. I'll try to come. So I'm still involved in those things. And uh, I'm at University Place, which contains uh, Quite a number of professors. That's where you live? That's where I'm living now. Okay. We have a good time together. Eat lunch every day with a former French professor and another one's former Spanish department. And uh, we have good times together. And many people have moved here because they have sons or daughters who are Purdue faculty members. And so they move from other parts of the country to be here close to them. So it's a, it's a very nice environment. And we enjoy being Where did you live before you moved out there? Where was your home? Well, we lived several places oh. around town over the years. But the last home we built was our retirement home. We lived at the west end of campus, or not campus, west end of, of the uh, metropolitan area, really, out in the country. If you uh, go out close to the Purdue Orchards, uh, there's a little cul-de-sac runs back in. Uh, it's called Shagbark Lane. And it dead ends against Purdue property, and we built a, a new house back at the end of that. 
got to live there about 10 years before some health problems with my wife caused us to, to look for a different living arrangement. And so then we moved to, to the university place. But I loved it out there because I grew up, you know, I'm not like a, a lot of people. If, if I use the word gun to you, you'd probably get yeah. terrified, you know. But I tell people I grew up in a different time, in a different place. So as a kid, I almost grew up with a gun in one hand and a fishing pole in the other. We fished and we hunted. So from that, I developed a great love of the outdoors, and I love that property to the west of us, which is Purdue property, which has not yet been developed, and is full of deer and coyotes and wild turkeys and wonderful things. No, I didn't hunt them there, but I, I took hikes and, and enjoyed Enjoy being, out, being in outdoors. Area. That's there. right, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Or a favorite Purdue tradition? Or an outstanding event or both? It's, or uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I enjoy being in a laboratory with students. I think students learn in a laboratory. So if I had one place I'd like to be, it's in a laboratory harassing students, you know, <laughs> enjoying. And, uh, instructing. Instructing them, but, you know, Sort but, of know, that old Socratic method, you know, of asking leading questions and see where they go with it and see the lights turn on. Oh, yeah. I see that now. Right. So I like that very much. Activities around Purdue, my wife and I have become great women basketball fans. Uh, we love that very much. Uh, you go to the all the games? We go to all the local games when we're in town and uh, sometimes go to the Big Ten tournaments and things like that when they're close by. Did you used to go to football? Uh, with, with oh, basketball? we used to go to the men's basketball games, the men or the football games, the women's basketball games. We enjoyed all those activities. Sure. But now we've had to cut back, and since there's a, a bus service that will run us directly from where we live now to the door at the arena for the women's basketball games, you can't beat it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> door to door. I uh, told Morgan Burke, though, that the women's basketball team had was causing me a great deal of difficulty in my career. And he got quite concerned and asked why. And I said, well, you have a lot of games on Sunday afternoons. And I like to go in and work on Sunday afternoons and get caught up. But since the game's on Sunday afternoon, I tell myself I can afford to run over right before the game starts, walk up in the arena, sit down, watch a half, and then go back and get back to work. It's a nice break. Well, what's wrong with that, said Morgan. And I said, what's wrong with it? I get hooked on the game. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, furthermore, in the more recent years, the crowds are so large, I can't move around under the basket and watch the things, watch them play the tricks that I used to try to play as a basketball player and then go up and try to watch it from another angle because the seats are all full anymore. And, uh, so we really do enjoy that. Yeah, um, um, in closing, or I'm going to leave it up to you. You've got some comments you'd like to make. I have <laughs> one, one Purdue story I would like to relate Please for do. the records. It involves my father. And so it's a very personal thing for me to to tell you this and a story which is very dear to my heart. Um, I grew up around construction work. I worked as an apprentice carpenter. I'm glad I had that background. My father thought I should have a craft, something to fall back on if the world fell apart. No matter what I was doing, that was important to know. And I still enjoy woodworking to this day, and we have a nice woodworking shop at University Place, and many of us are involved in that, that sort of thing. But I, my father said you know, to me one day, it's time for you to get a job, and you're going to come to work for me. And uh, I worked during high school and during my college years in the summers as a carpenter on construction work. So I, I learned to uh, appreciate it all went into that. And I knew my father had had some contact with Purdue in the early years. But, you know, when you're young, you don't pay attention to your parents on family matters and things like that. It's only after they're gone you get this really serious interest. So the story I'm about to relate to you occurred during 1967 or earlier, because my father died in 1967. He was up here. We took them to a football game on a Saturday. And Sunday we were sitting around. And I said, is there anything you'd like to do, Dad? And he said, you know, I'd like to go down on campus and walk around. Fine, we can do that. So we drove down, and we parked beside the E building. You could do that in those days. This was before the MSWE building was there. There was a nice mall in that area, and there were parking lots there. Mm -hmm. And that's where Grand Prix first started was in that area. Right. And I 
got out of the car and I said, well, what would you like to see? He said, I'd like to look at the chemistry building. Well, that just floored me. So we walked over to the old chemistry building and Dad was looking up at it and he says, I'm really glad to see that worked out okay. And I said, what worked out okay? Now, if you ever look up at the chemistry building, the old building, there are stones up there that have the old chemist's names. You know, I don't this remember. This is in Weatherall. Weatherall. The old building, right. And you look up there, and I remember Gilbert and Lavoisier. And I, I don't There are a lot of names up there. They're famous in chemistry. What are you talking about, Dad? And he said, well, we had real trouble with that. And I can't point to the stone today. I wish I'd written it down. And he said, well, I was, I was the contractor supervisor for the building of the second half of the old chemistry building. That building was built in two pieces. I did not know that. And I found out at that point in this conversation that went on that it was during a time when there was very little work, depression time, apparently. So I think it was between 1929 and 1932, because I was born in 1932 in Richmond, Indiana, another case where the contractor had to go out of Terre Haute to find a job, bid on some state-type work, and got the contract. So my father was a construction superintendent for the building simultaneously of the old pharmacy building, the second half of the old chemistry building, and about half of what is now the ME building. And I did not know that. So I learned a little bit about some Purdue history at that time. This was before I was born. And oh, nice. work was hard to find. And my grandfather needed a job. And my dad hired him to work on some of this construction work. So a little nepotism probably <laughs> took place there. What a nice, how nice. But I'm, I'm very proud of that part of my Purdue I would history. Say, I would say so. And I want to see some more activities in the archival group. And I'm going to try to dig through some old boxes because somewhere I have pictures that go back to the construction of those buildings. Wonderful. That will be really nice. I hope I can find them. Yes, that will be really nice. Uh, let's talk, oh, one thing I do want to ask, do you have any, any uh, you dad's a daughter, so then your grandchildren live close by? One granddaughter is now did, uh, did she, near did, Indianapolis. Did they, did they go to Purdue? No, oh. no. They're, they're, uh, they're fairly young oh, yet. Okay. Of course, everybody looks young to me anymore. Uh, the one granddaughter who lives reasonably close, we do see her fairly regularly, is a sophomore in high school. Oh, okay. The oldest granddaughter is in Tennessee and is in college down there now. Decided, suddenly she's changed direction since she got in college, and she wants to be a nurse, which I think is wonderful. Very good. That's nice, yeah. But they keep in touch. Their oh, yes. Yeah. yes. And, uh, that, and the other one... Uh, what year? What school? What year is she in nursing? Just she just started there. Or? She's just really started the nursing program. She okay. uh, she's been working in a healthcare facility, and decides she likes that kind of work and she wants to become a, a nurse. Great need in for some that. specialty area. She's sure. not sure yet what. All right, that's a, there's a great mm. need for that. She's in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, good. Okay. Any closing comments? That uh, anything special or you'd like to leave? Oh, us there with? are things I can talk forever. I tend to talk in fifty-minute intervals for some reason. It seems like. <laughs> well, but I've notes. enjoyed this very much, and uh, hope it will be useful to some. It will be, and I thank you very much, Professor Arkwright. This concludes it. Thank welcome. you very much. <clears throat> My pleasure.